Welcome to Sense and Sustainability, your podcast channel for sustainable procurement. We hope you like what you hear. Please go to www.iso2400.org for more information, learning resources, tools and much more. Hello and welcome to Sense and Sustainability, your podcast for all things sustainable supply chains. I'm delighted to introduce uh, the, the second of three podcasts with David Baggs from Australia. Um, he's going to talk to us about global green tag and how we're actually moving forward across the world with product certification and sustainability. So, uh, so we didn't really come on this call intending to talk about the Olympics, but it seemed like a good, good opportunity to, to start. So tell me a little more about green tag, because when we had our initial conversation, you know, that there seems to be a growing interest in EPDs, and particularly in the United States that we've seen quite recently and, and, you know, a little bit in Europe. But from what you were saying to me, you kind of go beyond EPDs, don't you? There's lots of features of uh, of green tag. Could you tell me a little more about it? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, uh, underlying everything, we are uh, an eco-label, basically. We run an eco-labeling program with a variety of different kinds of services and an environmental product declaration program op operator and we do EPDs as well. But uh, as we've come to understand, particularly with the increasing focus on circular economy, there is a, a need to take life cycle analysis beyond damage and impact assessment. Because as soon as you start getting into a, a cyclic economy where you're upcycling a material from a waste to a product, or you are, you know, going into a situation where you're restoring or avoiding impacts on natural systems and resources, you have to have metrics to measure the benefits that are being generated, or you're actually not giving a full picture of the product. So working with Ever Institute, who's a, a life cycle analysis expert uh, of many years, they developed the indicators and we've been working together to imp them, implement them. And now our EPDs, which, as I mentioned before, our eco platform recognized, uh, are an EN 15804 compliant EPD, and they have a an EPD benefit addendum. And so there's a complete inverse set of metrics to measure impact or, or damage and gain or benefit. And we use a ratio between benefit and impact uh, that is based on a recipe indicator recipe methodology indicator to create a, a ratio. And if the benefit is bigger than the impact, then we actually are moving towards a, a nature positive outcome. If impact is bigger than benefit, then it's a it's a take to level product. But, you know, as part of that process, we've also then realized, well, look, hang on, the circular economy needs a whole lot of different metrics. It's not just about uh, impacts on nature. It's actually about circularity of the resources, circularity of water, climate impacts, biodiversity impacts. Um, it's about um, the social benefit, uh, ethical supply chains, modern slavery, basically all of that. Metrics are needed for all of that. So we've developed a nature positive standard and a nature positive declaration, which in including the sort of toxicity, human and environmental toxicity pieces, roll up into a single indicator based on the EU product environment footprint uh, weighting study that they did that is normalized to planetary boundaries. And we can uh, give a single indicator and a bronze, silver, gold or platinum sort of nature positive rating, which tracks 105, 110, 120 or 150 or 150 plus nature positive outcomes or a, a single sheet that has a single sort of glance of all of the indicators on a, a sort of center line left negative in red right positive in green for each of the uh, nine indicators or a 45 page transparency report with every metric you'll ever want for a product uh, we believe hopefully it, it, every metric you'd ever want for a product included. And that's all sort of now rolled up in a 
in a uh, in a service that allows an assessment process for a manufacturer to figure out what their distance to target, well, for us to figure out and for them to understand what they want to do with it, a distance to target where they're at to where they need to be to go net positive. And from a net positive point of view, we're not necessarily saying, you know, equal to equal biodiversity. We're actually saying, well, no, you're having this global impact on environment. Somewhere in the world, you need to have a positive impact, hopefully where your factories are, but not necessarily. And when you've decided whether you want to be 105, 110, 20, 150% positive, let us know, show us the nature-based biodiversity offset. So we're wanting to restore complex ecosystems and in the process, draw carbon down from the atmosphere. So these are, these are offsets that generate carbon credits, but via a biodiversity restoration pathway. And then once you've figured that out, we'll actually give them the final uh, assessment that they can then publish and it comes with that, you know, 45 odd page uh, nature product declaration. And, you know, ultimately there is a, a significant amount of interest in that, actually. I've just, I'm like I spent nearly an hour and a half on the day, on today, just briefing WWF Australia uh, based on their interest. That is really, are you seeing an increasing interest to your customers? Because obviously, uh, this is a very complex issue when you start to think about biodiversity and all of the other impacts as well. But, you know, people are starting to talk seriously about scope three emissions now. That, that seems to be the driver towards looking in more depth at, at materials and actually what their impact is. Are you seeing an increased demand? Are, are you customers... Because this is a global product, isn't it? I mean, it's, we're not just talking about Australia. This is something that you... No, absolutely. It's a global product. We're, we're recognised globally. We're recognised globally. Um, yeah, no, look, yes, we're, there is a lot more interest. And, and the, the reason in the interest is because of the increased focus on circular economy. I mean, the, the three tenets of circular economy are reduce pollution, increase the life of resources and products, and restore and regenerate biodiversity. And everybody's just thinking about the top two and not thinking about the third. So, you know, if, and on top of that, there's a realization that climate is a symptom. Yeah. Biodiversity is, and, and, and a reduction in biodiversity is, is, is the major problem apart from reducing emissions that we can all do. And that is feeding and underpinning, uh, you know, the, the, the climate problem. So if we have an impact on biodiversity, uh, it helps us, it helps the ecosystems, it helps other, you know, living creatures, but it also reduces climate impacts so it's it's a win-win and it's working at the cause level not the symptom level and you know you've got the, the the biodiversity convention that 190 countries including australia and the uk just signed up to well most of the most of the countries on the planet signed up to to restoring 30 percent of biodiversity by 2050 and you know that uh, you've got massive you know un level nature positive policies and a massive change in focus towards these sort of natural systems outcomes. So when we look at global green tag on, on the commercial side of things, I mean, you know, obviously what you describe, you know, with a 45 page document, which certainly my, my former mayor of London would never have read, um, but nonetheless, the work needs to be done in order to get to the, to the one page summary that you need. Who pays? How does the commercial model work for that? Yeah, it's a good it's a good question. I mean, ultimately, what we're doing and where the interest in this product has come from is those people who are working in the circular economy who realize that they're not getting recognized for all the good work they're doing. It's those people that are making the net zero commitments and are already, you know, sort of leading the their their product sectors in in being net positive. And we don't need to do much of a tweak to those. So, you know, we have a product health declaration, which, you know, is a transparency report for toxicity, human and environmental toxicity. And we we take that beyond just the transparency. We take, we do risk further, we do multiple level risk analysis, and we actually end up with a healthiness in use rating for that product including asthma and allergy sensitivity claims, if that's, if that's relevant, which screens for a further thousand products not being in the 
in in uh, ingredients not being in the product. So if a if a, if a company has that has has a product health declaration and it has an EPD, we can do the rest from the data that we already have. Um, and beneficially, we can even work with third-party EPDs to to get the information from the EPD to do the analysis. We probably need a little bit more of an engagement with them if we haven't done the EPD, but we can do it from third-party EPDs. So from a manufacturer's point of view, the information demands are not much more than they're already doing. If you've got market leaders who are already doing carbon offsetting to get to net zero, then what we're doing by measuring benefit is potentially capturing more of the good things that they're doing, which means they don't have to buy as much offsets or they can buy the same value in offsets and buy slightly more expensive ones to do the nature-based offsetting solutions because we're actually capturing all of their value chain in the, in the, in the metrics that we're using for the first so there's time. There's real value in there for the, for the manufacturer. Thank you for listening to our podcast on Sense and Sustainability. Please listen out for more episodes. For more information, learning resources, tools, and much more content on sustainable procurement, go to www.iso2400.org.